Alright you guys, hope you guys are all doing well in this dreary month of January. It's been gloomy, it's been bleak. F*** you January, you kill Christmas. But let's kick January's butt out of the door and let's talk about bots that invented time travel. Meh. In this vid I'm gonna be talking about a bot that can snuff out entire realities. Yeah, yeah. One that invented teleportation. Yeah, sure, why not? Teleport, blah, 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 whatever. Potions to see through people's clothes. Yeah, yeah, potions to... Potions to what? And let's get started with Beachcomber. Oh my, What the f***? So Beachcomber, geologist, animal communicator, voice that sounds like it belongs to a disfigured drummer in a jazz band in 1930s South Carolina who's so disfigured that he can't get any groupies, so he approaches young travelers with a small folded up bit of paper full of brown powder saying, Wanna try something new? He also learned to talk to the animals, did I mention that? Well, let's see if I can learn your language. In my past life I murdered a man, that's why he's garbage now. Uh. He found a lovely lagoon full of electrum. Electrum. A naturally occurring element that would make Transformers impervious by making them bling. <laughs> Thing is, he knew that extracting the liquid would destroy the natural environment around it, so he didn't want to tell anyone. Of course, the secret got out, though. You want to be invulnerable? See? And the subsequent battle did leave the environment destroyed. Um, what's that sound? Oh no, oh no, here we go again. It's January, and the app ends with Beachcomber sitting in the middle of the destroyed landscape in a scene. We won. That I found possibly one of the most depressing in all of Transformers. In IDW, he unearthed a massive Transformer called Leviathan, who was combiner size, but wasn't actually a combiner. So Massive. I'd say the most surprising use, or misuse, of his skills would be when he helped Cosmos and Wheeljack to make a variable voltage harness to, um, ahem, punish Blaster when they thought he was a traitor. Alright people, thank you for helping me blow away some of my January blues. Make sure you're hitting the like and subscribe button, it really helps a sh** little channel like mine. Plus, this year is the 40 year anniversary of Transformers, so you know I'm gonna do something special. And let's carry on by looking at another geologist, a bot called Fractal who's looked down upon by his peers because he cared more about his science than he did about killing Maximals. He engineered a material called Thermonite that could create massive explosions when brought into contact with Energon. <laughs> Geomotus was another prominent geologist, fastidious in his methodology and meticulous in his attention to detail, sometimes bordering on the obsessive. <laughs> All of which could be down to the fact that he's written up as being neurodivergent. Tutored by Highbrow, worked under Freud, he helped track down terrorist organization The Rise by confirming suspicions that these microfissures that had been found were in fact the result of excavations and the building of an underground base. He was with Beachcomber when he found Leviathan and coached her into figuring out how to transform to help fight the rise. He later noticed that increasing geological activity could damage the basin that contained the Sea of Rust and release not only the sea, but the millions of rust worms that lived within it. But Geomotus is not to be confused with Geocensus. He was in Transformers Legends and would use his geological skills to scout for Energon. He was also absolutely massive apparently, but that's about all we know about him. Lug was also a geologist from IDW and she left Cybertron to embark on a bunch of adventures across the galaxy with her co-junct Endura Anode, who we'll talk about later. Okay, let's switch to biologists, the most famous of which is probably RC. Well, at least according to Ars Vector Prime, which wrote her up as first protoformed with a male chassis. Yeah, that whole can of worms. As such, she... No, wait, he travelled around discovering gender dysphoria disorder and eventually undergoing reformatting. In the 2019 IDW continuity, RC fell in love with Greenlight, who was a xenobiologist, and she would help in the investigation of several murders in the Iacon region, where she would help with autopsies and the like. The whole thing got especially personal to her and RC when a young bot called Rubble was murdered, Rubble being the same age as their own adopted child called Gage. Another biologist was a pretender called Diver, who dedicated himself to preserving Earth's oceans. <laughs> Then we have Nautica, assistant to the one and only Brainstorm, who I'm going to come back to in a minute. Brainstorm even made her a special wrench, which is a sort of a multi-purpose tool that even had like a light that would come on to signal that she was exaggerating. I don't know, maybe Brainstorm was just joking with that. But the wrench would also cancel out attention deflectors, which were these sort of cloaking devices used by Ravage and among others. But Nautica was not only a biologist, she was a talented engineer, cartographer and linguist. Pretty snappy dancer too, it looks like. Then there was Pablo, yeah I refuse to call him Wheeljack, but he was also a general inventor and scientist too, but clearly had a love for the butterflies. It sounds like we are going to die. Okay, another biologist now, and just when you thought Beast Machines could not get any weirder.
What you're actually looking at is a specialist in plant biology, appropriately named Botanica. In the midst of Beast Machine's bio-organic nightmare, we had this chick who turned into a walking f***ing plant. Now, obviously, this wasn't random. Her and her crew landed on planet Cryptid, I guess, dominated by walking plants and took on matching alt modes to better study their way of life. She had the ability to spread seas all over the shop and would spread like these vines, but could also fire out this huge lightning blast. I put a post up a couple of days ago asking what you thought was the weirdest alt mode in Transformers. To me, she definitely deserves to be on that list. But check that out and let me know which you think is the weirdest. Anyway, back to botanists, we got Brushguard from the Transformers Timelines tech stories, who, when he's not binging Earth's B-movies, he's finding new and horrible ways to enhance the lethality of local flora. For example, he impaled Whirl with a vine spear, as well as managing to make this sphere full of fast-growing vines, full of a corrosive fluid that could eat through almost anything. Yikes. Revenge of the Fallen Mixmaster wasn't just good at mixing cement because he was considered a genius chemist. He was famous for using his skills to create weapons for higher ranking Decepticons and using unwilling subjects to test them out on. According to his toy bio, all of the toxins he's been around has had a corroding effect on his brain, causing him to become more reckless and prone to risk taking. And just on a side note, as with some of the other Bayverse Constructicons, it's said that there may be more than one bot with this body type. Damn, he's massive! Is he that much bigger than Ironhide? Dr. Flaskenstein reckons that it wasn't the Energon Storm that brought all the bot bots to life. Her theory, chemistry. Not sure I get the logic, but it does give her a good excuse for a load of experiments and stuff. Another chemist was Oil Slick, who specialized in weaponized compounds, and in the animated continuity, was responsible for the robot plague known as Cosmic Rust. Although in the comics, he ended up firing it into the wind and getting splashed with it. And when Ratchet showed mercy on him and patched him all up, Oil Slick said thank you by blasting him with the cosmic rust and running away with the antidote. Yoink. He also engineered the reverse evolution virus, which would devolve Autobots into Decepticons, and according to the Allspark Almanac, with the help of Scalpel, created Toxicron and Nemesis Prime using stolen schematics of Optimus. Oil Slick was later killed by Galvatron, according to something Cyclonus said in the Allspark Almanac. So God knows what he did wrong. Although it doesn't take a lot, does it? But you know what? Now that we've mentioned Scalpel, let's jump in and do a quick spotlight on him. First being seen in Revenge of the Fallen, he reportedly has vast databases on robotic and organic species across the galaxy, having dissected and vivisected hundreds of unwilling subjects. He's probably most famous for reviving and rejuvenating Megatron from the Mariana Trench, then inserting this wormy thing into Sam Witwicky before extracting it and ripping it to pieces to extract the information. On top of that, it's been rumored that he can self-replicate, as we saw similar, although not identical, versions working on Megatron's damaged head in Dark of the Moon. The Transformers animated version of the character spent years repairing Mindwipe, as well as discovering that Cyclonus was from the future. But back to chemists. Another chemist was Quick Mix from the Marvel comics, a rash and impatient Autobot who once filled a Decepticon hideout with cement, cement laced with nebulae, so it was pretty much unbreakable, encasing them alive forever, probably. Do you remember Highwire from Armada? Well, he was a chemist in the comics who was obsessed with saving Cybertron in a kind of environmental kind of way, having developed a cleaner way to process fuel and waste materials. Cosmos was an astronomer in Transformers Animated, although he was kind of just a cameo. It was also Professor Scope from BotBots, but I think it was just a toy, unfortunately. He looks cool. Next up, we've got Astroscope, who transformed into one of those microscopes for looking at stars with. I mean, everyone knows the Hubble Astroscope, right? <laughs> A big one was Flatline, who was a Decepticon surgeon working under Thundercracker and given the task of coming up with a new generation of more powerful Decepticon warriors. Warriors? I mean, I mean warriors, obviously. Like, warriors just sitting there biting their fucking nails. He took many a fledgling protoform and subjected it to God knows what before they would ultimately die and have to be recycled. I guess that's why he got his name. He attempted to reprogram the Dopey Twins, Skids and Mudflap, but only ended up making them even more stupid. He then scavenged the remains of Chromia when Shockwave killed her in battle, taking them back to his lab for study and eventually combining them with RC Spark after she had been ripped to pieces by Thundercracker and transferred her consciousness into the three bodies we saw in Revenge of the Fallen. She then escaped, freed Skids and Mudflap, and Flatline fled. There was another incarnation of this character in IDW, who built a whole new body for Starscream, repaired Superion, got possessed by Exocon. Ratchet is another huge character, having played a variety of different roles across all of the continuities, and probably too big a character to fit in this one vid, so I'm gonna give him a spotlight video at some point in the future. But I will talk about Farmer, Ratchet's former best friend. 
Not sure if you ever see his alt mode, but he looks like he turns into a fighter jet, which is quite aggressive for a med bot, I think you'll agree. They usually turn into ambulances or rescue choppers, things like that. Anyway, that's just your first clue that this guy isn't just another med bot. He took a post at the Delphi Medical Facility deep within Decepticon held territory. So of course, it wasn't long before the cons came knocking. He made a deal with Tarn to keep him supplied with transformation cogs from dead bots in exchange for being left alone. Question is, what happens when there aren't any dead bots with TCOGs to harvest? Well, farmers started euthanizing them. Then just outright started murdering them. When Ratchet arrived to investigate the goings on, he was captured and tortured by the mad surgeon and he cut his assistant Ambulon in half with a chainsaw. This guy plotted and schemed until he had his head blown off by first aid before his body was taken as an avatar for Adaptus who used his body to enact his evil master plans. Okay, maybe this is a good time to do a quick interlude just to thank those of you that have joined as members. It means a hell of a fuck of a lot to me that you'd support me in this way. So thank you to all who have joined, but especially these guys who get a shout out for joining the higher levels. Arch Deluxe, Philip Romberger, Monta, and Shane Sajo. You guys rock. Thank you so much. Egoistic depravity. Those are my favorite words that have been used to describe Deluge. He was not only a mad scientist hell-bent on creating the most monstrous doomsday weapons, but also a stormtrooper. Remember those? I talked about those in the last vid. That would fire out highly pressurized liquids. In the IDW continuity, he was the one that tried to weaponize the Insecticons, which famously gave only three positive results and an army of animalistic brainless clones, which killed him. Yep, killed by his own invention. Perhaps more interesting though was the incarnation which was featured in Beast Wars Uprising that started off as an Autobot before defecting. He committed many an atrocity while trying to recreate one percenters before finally creating Protoform X, which of course kicked off the entire chain of events that we know as the Beast Wars. Oh, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, basically at one point it turned out that Optimus Primals and the Axiom's mission was to strand Protoform X on a barren planetoid somewhere when it got pulled into the whole thing with the Predacon's ship and then went back in time. Experimental was not a scientist, rather a scientific guinea pig. <laughs> That's why he looks so worried, I guess. Brainstorm has a long, long, long list of inventions and weapons to his name, including in one continuity, partly inventing the Headmaster process. He made Fort Max even bigger and even stronger and helped create the Autobot Pretenders. He might have even created mass shifting as he created the mass displacement gun that shrunk Rodimus and his crew down to eliminate nanocons from inside Magnus's body. He used a baby cyber ray from Dead Universe to create a force field to protect Orion Pax so he could enter the Universal Dead Zone. But his most notable invention has to be that time machine that he fit neatly into a briefcase. Now he did this so he could go back in time and save the bot he loved. I can't remember who that was right now. Was it Quark? It was Quark, wasn't it? Which, with a little help from Perceptor, once created a parallel universe called the Functionist Universe. Basically, that was a timeline where Megatron died fairly early on, and therefore, the Great War never happened. So the Functionist took power from the Cybertronian Senate and deemed that a bot's alt mode would define their function in life. But now that I mentioned Perceptor, 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 man. Big brain, brainiac, but also lethal deadeye shootist. Pew! So this is a guy that's been central to many an Autobot victory. His ability to conjure up a plan out of nothing has often enabled the good guys to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat often in the face of overwhelming odds. He has expertise in a plethora of different fields and knowledge of many, many subjects. He actually started out as a security officer in the IDW universe before being part of the team that led by Thunderwing, who discovered that planet Cybertron would soon be running out of Energon. He somehow wound up working in Jetfire's science team where they discovered a dormant Trypticon slumbering under the Toraxis mega refinery. He modified Pretender Tech to stabilize Cup after he went crazy, and then after realizing the limitations of his small frame after being damaged in a heavy battle, he gave himself a series of upgrades, including an armored breastplate that was nearly unbreachable, an aiming monocle, and arm stabilizers, which all made him a formidable sniper who managed to one-shot the combiner Monstructor. He got so good that he was recruited into the Wreckers. He managed to get access to the supercomputer called Aquitas before shooting Overlord's hand off and then mistakenly declared that Ratchet's theory that Megatron could harness antimatter was stupid. Which is funny, because that's exactly what he did. Remember when he used it to kill Overlord and Tarn? Anyway, he then went off to find Cyber Utopia on the Lost Light with Rodimus and the rest of his crew. In G1, he made a transmat reduction beam to shrink himself down to microscopic proportions, enabling him to sever the connection of the heart of Cybertron to Megatron's body. The heart of Cybertron was like this massive power source that could give a Transformer unlimited strength. 
least blast lasers out of his fingertips. And then when the bots got stuck on Giant Planet, he made a toy rocket ship into a real functioning spaceship to get the bunch of stranded Autobots the hell out of there. He then came up with a cure for cosmic rust. He managed to get Hot Rod, Ultra Magnus, RC, and Springer back into their robotic bodies after they had their personalities transplanted into organic ones. He increased the Dinobot's brain power. With some Autobots, you have to explain everything. He discovered that the Matrix had another previously unknown property that could transform Optimus into Laser Rod Prime in the G2 story pages, Laser Rod Prime, and discovered that a multiversal material called Alternium that had the ability to store the memories and even entire life forces of sentient beings. Wow. Anyway, moving on, the mutant Leatherhide was a pretty crazy one. He was researching 0.1 percenters to try and figure out how to replicate their assets and strengths before he undertook a series of bizarre experiments on mechanimals, which were basically Cybertron's animal life. They were basically animals. The experiments were obviously met with a few raised eyebrows, so he fled to the sludge swamps to carry on his research in secret. He created a few Mondo Weirdo breeds, including the Slicers and various other monstrosities, before eventually disregarding his own robot mode altogether. He was eventually recruited by Beast Megatron, and with his accomplice Labrat, they created Fusors and Horicons galore. Probably the most prominent scientist in all of Transformers, I reckon has to be Wheeljack. Bayverse Wheeljack built many a weapon for weapon specialist Ironhide, who used one of them to destroy an entire planet called Kyber 5. And when he got told off for it by Prime, he simply said that that hunk of rock was going to get blown up anyway. Anyway, back to Bayverse Wheeljack, his advances in weaponry supposedly allowed the Autobots to catch up with the Decepticons, as it said that they'd lag behind in terms of firepower for quite a long time. But before that, Wheeljack started out following Sentinel Prime, creating a device that could link to the AllSpark and teleported an entire star into Cybertronian space, which would replenish the AllSpark and provide energy to the whole planet. Hope nobody was, you know, using that star, you know, for life. In Gen 1, his inventions tended to go horribly wrong, either exploding unexpectedly or, you know, well, even when they were meant to explode, like this one, which was meant to trap the cons inside a collapsed mountain. Well, it killed loads of photons and sent Prime tumbling down a cliff, but the Decepticons, well, I guess they just walked out because in the next episode, they were just there again. He came up with a device that would put Teletron 1 in control of Skywarp's body and was integral to saving Optimus's life when he was wounded by the cons. He also created the Dinobots, obviously, and then when they went nuts, he invented a magnetic inducer to bring them back under control. He cobbled together this gizmo that capped a fountain of energy. He gave the Autobots hydrofoil so they could get the drop on the cons from the water. He built a shock blast cannon which exploded when he tried to fire it. And of course, turned Spike into the Frankenstein-like beast known as Autobot X. He sent RC helicopters after Devastator after he turned into King Kong and managed to freeze himself with a device he called the Wheeljack Instant Immobilizer. He did have a few successes though, like his anti-transfiction grenade managed to unfree the rest of the Autobots, and his Dominator Discs did bring the Constructicons under Autobot control, as well as his super weapon, called the Negavator, was so effective that the Decepticons made stealing it their number one priority. He built an entire ship in a book called Search for Treasure Under the Sea before he was eventually and heartlessly killed off in the Battle of Autobot City in the 1986 movie. But of course, that's not the end of the story for Wheeljack, is it? There was an episode of Transformers Victory called Ginrai Dies, but guess what? Ginrai didn't die. Do you know why? Because Wheeljack is why. Not only that, he resurrected him in a more powerful body. And not only that, he made it so that he, now called Victory Low, could combine with Star Saber to form Victory Saber. He made a transformation super cog in the Legends comic, but how that differs from a regular transformation cog, fuck if I know. The Genetronic Translink system was another of his inventions, a device that allowed a single bot to control several several duplicate bodies, something that he hoped would allow him to survive his death in the Battle of Autobot City. This is a touch complicated here, uh, it takes place in the Binal Tech world and basically involves Ravage messing with the timeline. I might do a vid called When Transformers Messed With Time at some point, and I'll talk about that more then. But that wouldn't be his only foray into body duplication, as in the E-Hobby comics, he created the Battle Droids, these copies of Optimus's black body form. Oh, interesting Wheeljack fact, Wheeljack fans. In the storyboards for the original movie, it was meant to be Smokescreen that was seen lying dead. But anyway, in the Dreamwave continuity, he had this thing where he felt more comfortable in vehicle mode, saying that he did his best thinking in his alt mode, and was involved in coming up with a new design for a huge ship that would carry the Autobots to safety. Yep, you guessed it, the Ark. And he oversaw 
its construction. He nearly killed himself again though when testing a neutron detonator shell. He was literally blown to pieces, but luckily Ironhide and Ratchet put him back together again. He invented stasis cuffs to subdue the Decepticons in Mars Attacks the Transformers and built a jail for Mega Megatron in the Creo online comic. Out of Creo blocks, of course. As well as inventing a potion called Skeletron, which gave the bots see-through power and also gave Knockout an excuse to get Megatron in a little pink frilly dress. All that said though, I would say his hugest, most important invention was the Winged Moon from IDW's 2019 continuity, which in the midst of Cybertron's energy crisis could harvest energy from space itself and transfer it down to the planet's surface using the tether. Oh, he also invented himself a daughter in Earthspark. Well, kinda, kinda. Basically, he invented these drones and then Twitch uh, based her alt mode on the drone, so she started calling him dad. And he also invented himself some facial hair and a mean mohawk. But wait, his ears don't light up anymore. A Decepticon scientist called Rossum was the one who initially figured out that you could graft an Untrium to a 0.1%er's chassis to create phase sixes. He had to be talked into subjecting Overlord to the process fearing that making a being that angry and resentful so powerful could only end one way. And he was proven right, because after Megatron managed to twist his arm, first thing Overlord did after the procedure was complete was crush Rossum's head. Simicor was an orangocon with a temper, and when one of his experiments went horribly wrong, one of his outbursts landed him on the prison ship Alcamore. He was kind of beefcake too, being able to take on bots as powerful as Grimlock, and he wouldn't hesitate to give a smackdown to anyone who angered him. <laughs> He had these two Minicon assistants too, called Axiom and Theorem, who Simicor tried to clone. But his main aim was to build a ship capable of getting him off this rock and back to Cybertron. I mentioned Vertebrake in the last vid too. He was the Snakecon that stole Sideswipe's body, remember him? He was the slithery Dr. Frankenstein of Doom who traveled the galaxy searching for methods and knowledge that would enable him to create the perfect Cybertronian, then embarked on a spree involving grave robbing, parts trafficking, and even kidnap and forced mutilation. Now what really freaks me out about this guy is that he operated on himself and removed his own head to transplant it onto Sideswipe's body. Starscream, Soundwave, and Shockwave all deserve their own videos, so make sure to keep an eye out for those, and um, you can check out my Shockwave one in the meantime. The Autobot technicians would supply the troops with equipment, ammunition, and intelligence, until they were ripped apart by flamed robotic zombies in the Marvel comics. Roger, I'm up for a little action. Crosswise from Robots in Disguise was the Spy Changers, resident Big Brain, Big Brain. And his main quest in life was to unlock the potential of Spark Engines. Spark Engine was this thing that would give Transformers like a super mode, increasing their speed and acceleration, and even sometimes gaining the ability to teleport short distances. Not that fucking short though, look how, how far- It's not too big a stretch of the imagination to figure out that Hydra Dread loved designing fluid-based weapons, making things like acid rifles and spooge bombs, maybe. And when Hydra Dread and Rage were trapped in a cave that had caved in, trapped, Rage had to melt Hydra Dread's leg off with his own acid rifle. Another microscope bot is Quark from IDW 2005, who would really love for all this war nonsense just to blow over so he can get on with looking at really, really small things. Anyway, he was melted down by Tarn and the DJD, prompting Brainstorm, who was in love with Quark, to come up with an insane time travel scheme to go back and save him. In the Functionist universe where he didn't get smelted, he was put in charge of figuring out just what the hell Rung's alt mode was meant to be, with it eventually transpiring that it was a kind of like a device to make matrixes, like the matrix if I remember correctly. We gotta mention Arblus and Kranix, who were assistants to the Lythone scientist, who probably made the discovery of his career right before Unicron showed up to eat the whole planet. Loud Pedal worked under Shockwave and Knockout in Of Masters and Mayhem, and long story short, accidentally created Toxitron. Toxitron has got a bunch of different origins depending depending on which continuity you're in though. Let's quickly squeeze in a non-Cybertronian now, and Monitorus, who was from Tau Ursa, and featured in Transformers in 3D. He made something called the Integron device that would increase the strength of Energon until Galvatron stole it and repurposed it into the Nullification Cannon, which would render Energon useless. In the Titan movie comics, we get Skywarp, or at least the Bayverse version of Skywarp. He was a weapons creator, but also tried to repair Devastator after that battle in, um, what was it, Giza? To hide from prying eyes, he made this machine to create a thick cloud cover for them. Didn't really work though, Stratosphere still saw them, turned the machine on his creator, obscuring his vision and forcing him to crash. <laughs> Oh my god. Then there was a bot called the Stalker in the Rise of the Dark Spark game, who had a story that was discovered through the audio logs. And he was kind of like a David Attenborough type nature observer who secretly studied the Autobots and Decepticons whilst cloaked. Now, I haven't played Rise of the Dark Spark yet. I plan to as soon as I can get my hands on a copy. So keep an eye on my gaming channel for that. The Fly was a funny one from the Ask Vector Prime side of things. Um. 
Yeah, I don't really know what's going on here either. Ape Link was a computer xenoscientist, whatever that may be, and designed weapons including these, which were called impact maces. Perhaps we should call them impact maces because otherwise people might not know there's an impact involved. Oh, yes, people might get them confused with cuddle maces. But the real reason I selected him for this list was that he invented something known as a transfer interlink, which I think might be like the replicators in Star Trek because they're said to download digital objects into reality and manifest them as real tangible objects. Objects. Ape Link used this thing to create a digital hoverboard in the comics, as well as a variety of weapons, as well as a whole living transformer. That's, that's right, this guy called Catscan. I'm not sure we know what kind of scientist Voss was in his previous life as Force Doc, but judging by his actions, I picture him kind of like that doctor from Human Centipede, you know, like. If only I could take my face off and line it with the spikies. The Predacon's resident mad scientist was Tarantulus, who according to his toy bio, was suspected in the disappearances of many Earthlings, and rumors swirled of giant cocoons where he stored his prey. He made a floating lens that could lock a transformer in its beast mode, and infected Rhinox with a virus that would cause him to sneeze and therefore expel Energon until his Energon supply was completely gone. He created a bunch of mini-me's called Arachnoids, a maze in the 2021 comics, a massive disruptor cannon in a cave, which Megatron wanted to use to destroy the Ark, but also the Mind Drill, which was this interrogation device that used nanoprobes to target specific regions of a Transformer's mind, reconstructing pathways and neurological structures to make the bot generally more amenable to spilling the beans. He had a hand in building the combiner tech that led to Predacus. He designed a giant mobile fortress called the Arachnid. He invented stasis bullets, deceptive bombs, and what was called a positive reinforcement prison, which kept enemies docile by trapping their minds in a dreamlike delusion and feeding them their greatest desires. When in reality, they were probably in some dank cave somewhere strung up in a web. Prowl junked the idea though, saying that it wasn't a particularly punishy punishment and pushed Tarantulas to push ahead with spark extraction instead. <laughs> Much more punishy, I think you will agree. In what he considered his greatest ever achievement, he invented a being a transformer called Osteros. He was so proud of it because it was indistinguishable from any other bot, who would be found by Impactor and would eventually become Springer. But personally, I think that the noise maze is his most bonkers invention, a pocket reality assembled from harvested matter gaps in the fabric of our universe, where bots are transported into their own nightmare, basically, and slowly tormented until driven insane, or until their heads explode. Oh wait, and in this continuity, he also pioneered mass displacement too, which allowed him to shrink down enter Roadbuster's head, manipulating him to doing a bunch of fucked up shit, then regaining his size, exploding the poor guy's head in the process. And in Earthspark, Nightshade helped him build an avatar that he could use to start a new life among humans. He just wanted to be normal. Okay, time to talk about Flame. A reclusive Autobot scientist who transforms into a tank-treaded flamethrower, spewing napalm or whatever to melt Cybertronian steel and flesh. In the Marvel comics, he wanted to turn the whole of Cybertron into a mobile war world, which would travel the galaxy as an enormous base from which to launch the conquest of entire worlds. Whilst building massive engines to push the planet through space, he accidentally blew up his lab and a large chunk of Kallus, the city that it resided in. And to protect himself from all the attention that this drew, he activated some kind of transmission like a signal that would reanimate the corpses of the recently dead to create a literal dead zone in what used to be Kallus. Long story short, it took the Wreckers to brave the zombified city and Impactor to sacrifice his life to stop Flame by spearing him through the head. In the IDW comics, he was tried by the supercomputer Aquitas for various hideous crimes, including desecration and the mutilation of corpses, illicit spark transplants, and torture by circuit boarding, which I guess is like waterboarding. You know, waterboarding, that thing that the Hawaiians do where they slide down a big wave on a plank? Waterboarding. He was listening to these sickening events that made Chief Justice Tyrus start thinking that all bots that had been constructed cold, as Flame had been, were evil, and began his plan to wipe them all out. But you know what, that's another story. Yeah, feel me. Anyway, Flame went to prison for years. <laughs> was released by Shockwave, who needed him just in case the DJD showed up. After that, he teamed up with Scorponok and the Grand Architect, and was involved in a scheme to create a new kind of Transformer called Infinites. Bots who could transform into literally anything, and had an infinite number of alt modes. He also learned how to resurrect the dead in the Transformers vs. G.I. Joe comics, where he began performing mystic dark rituals. Another prominent one loved science and engineering so much that he upgraded every part of his body 
<laughs> to keep it as cutting edge as possible. I'm going to hold a little back here when it comes to this guy because I'm going to talk about him in my vid about Transformers that switch sides. But just briefly, he made himself a radiation shielding armor to defeat Sunstorm in the Dreamwave comics. A cool as fuck drone called Doc or DOC. His discovering of the nightmare signal saved Bumblebee and stopped him going mad. He tried to cure the deranged minds of the Monstructor 6. And his rivalry with Skybite apparently ended up with a star going supernova. That wiped out seven civilizations. Seven? And it was Jetfire that investigated strange energy readings leading to him discovering the return of our next entry, Thunderwing. I've mentioned Thunderwing a fair few times on the channel now, but in a nutshell, he subjected himself to a polydermal grafting, a process of grafting tissue culled from living subjects onto a transformer to create an armored symbiotic carabas. This process gave him the power he sought, but also sent him wildly insane. And thankfully for the Cybertronians, who were totally powerless to stop him, he was swallowed by Cybertron itself. In Of Masters and Mayhem, he experimented on himself again to give himself a green spark like the One Percenters. And it did make him super powerful. But Shockwave found out, extracted it, and used it to make the Matrix of Malice. So as evil as Thunderwing was, Shockwave was like, hold my energy on the box string. Rhinox was possibly my favorite bot growing up. One of my favorite bots. This big hulking tank was also unusually smart. Not just smart, but one of the smartest. He also had a very strong moral compass too, so he was like the perfect right-hand man for Optimus Primal. He repaired the ship and crew many, many times, displaying both engineering and medical skills, as well as developing an automated defense system for the Axelon called Sentinel, which sent the cons running tail between their legs on many an occasion. He also made a beer hat for himself to ingest the counter virus to Tarantulas' Energon discharge virus. In the 3H comics, Primus allowed Optimus to choose two bots to bring back from the dead, so he chose Depth Charge and our boy here, who then built a device to counteract Unicron's attempts to abduct Transformers to help in the universe. War. He dissected a Crimzeek in the name of the Cybertronian Ministry of Science, and unfortunately, didn't really do that much at all in Rise of the Beasts. Apart from this, which was cool. <laughs> Let's talk psychologists. There was, there was this one called Inferno. No, not that batshit crazy fire ant from Beast Wars, but this guy from the movie comics. He played a small part in a mission to defend the Allspark, but was quickly damaged and, you know, never heard about again. Then there was Freud, who's mainly known for developing a fascination with his patient, the serial killer Sunder, and eventually becoming his accomplice, feeding the Terra Hex killer with the memories of Freud's patients. Nom nom nom, lovely brains, nom nom nom. But before all that, he was sent in to give a personality adjustment to a certain mining bot who was threatening to set off an uprising. And he almost did too which would have changed the entire course of events, if not for an energy surge, which must have panicked the safety bots into triggering an evacuation order, and meant that Megatron carried on on his course to plunge the entire empire into civil war. All because of some safety bot! Ragebite was the Sharktacon from Transformers Robots in Disguise who began fusing Cybertronian tech with various Earth-found objects to create more and more powerful, boomy devices and explosive -y devices to blow things up. Primacron invented Unicron in the G1 continuity, which by himself makes him possibly the most unhinged maniac on this list. But not only did he invent Unicron, no, he created this, this energy being called Tornadron, that on paper was even worse. Grimlock took care of that though by, um, pulling a lever. And unfortunately, it's never explained why this guy is so desperate to take over the universe. Professor Pig created Energonicon drones to battle against the Eggbots, and Spanner was an expert in teleportation and interdimensional travel, until Stractus integrated him into a space bridge, that is. Highbrow has been touted as one of the most intelligent bots that ever was, and studied Exocon's near-godlike powers in the comics, and has been heavily involved with Headmaster Tech over the years. One of the most prominent mad scientists in all of Transformers was Scorponok, but I already did a whole video on him, so you know, so go check that one out. As was Bombshell, who I talked about at length in this video right here. But Giaxus is someone I really haven't gone into that much before on this channel. He was first introduced in the Marvel comics, although he wasn't really a scientist in those. So let's skip to Regeneration 1, where he pulled his knowledge with four other great savants into a massive database called the Underbase. Then he killed them, stab, flame, head crush, head burst. <laughs> Uh, took control of it for himself, using the vast knowledge to conquer vast swathes of space and create the Hub Network, a web of interlinked cyberformed planets with the throne world at its center. Jaxus wanted to add Cybertron to the network and pretty much cleanse it of all intelligent life. 
There was this huge battle where the Wreckers did most of the heavy lifting, and just as Giaxus was about to get involved in the fighting himself, he saw that Starscream had been possessed by the Underbase, and the spirits of the four big brain savants absorbed him into their mindscape. In the IDW continuity, he chewed to Shockwave, performing hideous experiments trying to resurrect various lost arts of Cybertronian science. Top priority was the art of combination, but also the reintroduction of gender into the species, which left his volunteer, RC, a rage-filled basket case. He developed an energy-leaching weapon called the Vampire Ribbon, which sucked its enemy's life force out before using it as ammo. <laughs> He invented reactive armor, an Iron Man type suit that mirrored an opponent's physical form and therefore their weapons and abilities. As I said before, he successfully made the combiner known as Monstructor, although it was batshit crazy, before discovering a portal to the dead universe. And with Nova Prime, who became Nemesis Prime just because I guess it was a good time to ramp up the scary, set up, and I have to pronounce this carefully, Negacores which would help the dead universe seep into the regular universe. He hooked a time machine up to Shockwave and using Galvatron as a portal, the two scientists siphoned the potential life force of the dead universe, which would, you know, long story short, allow Shockwave to control time and space. Then, in a bizarre attempt to bring the Autobots and Decepticons together in the Wings universe, he created an army of clones of various Decepticons, including one called Megaplex, which was, of course, a clone of Megatron himself. Weirdly enough, his plan did work in the end, uniting the factions against him, but Megaplex did turn against him and kill him. Anyway, make sure you subscribe, because at some point I'm going to make a vid ranking all these supervillains, so I'm quite curious to see where this guy's going to land in the scheme of things. But there was also a Decepticon called Killswitch that was mentioned in Ars Vector Prime somewhere, who reportedly created a plausibility matrix that could calculate every permutation of every particle in the Milky Way galaxy from the beginning to the end of time. He also proclaimed that it could snuff out entire branches of the multiverse, killing entire realities in a snap of his fingers. Dang, son. And in my time doing these videos, I have seen some massacres. But this is beyond biblical. An entire reality, an entire universe of life. Kill switch. You a bad dude. Please don't snuff out my reality. All right, thank you guys for watching this far into the vid. Next up, I'm either going to work on horrific things that have happened to Optimus or maybe a video about Transformers that have swapped size. I've definitely got more to say on Transformers 1, so make sure you're keeping it locked for all that stuff. So I will see you very soon for the next one. Thanks again for watching and cheerio bye.